Well, welcome to the second half of our study through the book of 1 Thessalonians. This is session seven and very excited to have uh, all of you with us as we've been talking about how to revive and restart, uh, to, to enter God's revived new life, even in times of crisis like the recording of this, we've been going through uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And so as we get started with part two, with the second half of this study, how's this for a title? Why sex is such a big deal? Um, you know, there's so much in my pre-Christ behavior that is sinful and shameful. My wife would say the same thing. Uh, somehow, uh, some way, we, uh, we both managed to remain virgins until we married. So um, we, we think regularly about the beauty and wonder of our, of our wedding day and also about the very first words that I ever heard my wife say when she had become my wife. So we've, we've waited 20 years for this moment and we got married on August the 2nd, 1980 in the heat wave of 1980 in Texas. Uh, it was over 110 for weeks in a row. The day we got married, it was 114 degrees. We got married at Miller Chapel on the campus of Baylor University. And we came straight out of the chapel, down the stairs, um, to a waiting car that took us to the reception. As soon as the doors open, the heat hit us, and it's just almost un indescribable how hot it was. And so I walk my wife in her wedding dress to the car. I get in the car, I climb in beside her, and I put my arm around my new bride. And she says those beautiful first words of marriage to me. Don't touch me. Those were the first words I ever heard my wife say. And I thought, I don't think it's supposed to work this way. But we laugh about that a lot. But you know, from the, from the time that I came to Christ, my discipleship brought home to me the biblical teaching that sexual purity is a big deal. Now, listen, we can actually make too big of a deal of sexual sin. How, how do you do that? Well, by acting like it's the only sin that God takes seriously. He takes all sin seriously. But it is true that some sins have greater consequences than others. And again, that's not just sexual sin. James, for instance, says God will literally oppose you if you're proud. So uh, we don't have too many uh, scandals in churches that are identified as because uh, somebody in the church was proud, prideful, egotistical. Um, we should take that more seriously because God does. But God does say some really serious things here um, in the book of 1 Thessalonians about sexual sin, and we need to understand why. So let me read you the first eight verses of chapter 4. Finally then, Paul says, Brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Very interesting. We'll look at that in a minute. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, the first two verses tell us that the rest of this book is designed to help us know how to please God. And that's always the most important question, the best question of all. That the question whose answer will open the door to everything God has for you. Here's the question. What is the will of God? Now, if you know Jesus, isn't that a question that you ask a lot anyway? What, what's the will of God? But we may... We may not often ask it in the right way. Usually what we're saying is, what should I do in this particular situation? What's the will of God to take this job or to marry this person? Or what is the will of God in this decision? Nothing at all wrong with asking for God's wisdom in that way. But it's the wrong first step to knowing his will. Because you actually already know the most important answer to the question. 
It's right here in front of you, right here in, in verse 3. We're told what God's will is. First of all, God's will is your sanctification. Now, that's a big word. Let me simplify it. The word sanctification simply means to be set apart for God alone, to be holy. The word holy simply means holy His. W-H-O-L-L-Y. It'll help you remember the meaning of the word holy. To be holy His. We see, we see that concept in verse 4, the concept of holiness. We see it again in verse 7. It's all over the scripture. And this is really the key to everything. If you want to know what to do about anything in life, how to make a particular decision, you'll find that answer more clearly by first, before you worry about, do I take this job? Do I marry this person? Ask this question. What would allow me to best be set apart for God? What would allow me to best be set apart for God? So some things will be much simpler. Should I marry this person? Well, this person doesn't really walk with the Lord. Hmm, that might not allow me to be, first of all, set apart for God. This job I'm thinking about taking, well, it feels to me like it would take me out of accountability, out of godly relationships that are important in this season of my life. Maybe this job would not allow me to first be set apart for God. You see how this works? That's, that's the, the first question when you want to know the will of God, is what would allow me to be most set apart for Him. Well, so whatever God says first, when He says, I want you to be sanctified, that's the top of the list. That's a big deal. And God says that you're to abstain from sexual immorality. That's the first thing He lists. That's not the only thing, but the first thing He talks about when He's telling His people how to be sanctified. So why is sex such a big deal? Well, first of all, for most people, it's it's the, the biggest battle. Uh, it's not true for everyone, but most people that my wife and I talk to, when they really get down to their struggles, and it used to be mostly men would say this. I don't find that any anymore. Society has changed, and I think for most men and most women, um, s sexual struggles are some of, if not our greatest, temptations. Years ago, I was talking to a pastor in his early 80s, a retired pastor, and I asked him a question. I said, uh, I'm a young man, I wanna walk in holiness. I said, when it comes to sexual temptation, um, at what point in life would you say that that gets easier to deal with? Again, he's like 82, and he said, I'll let you know. <laughs> so for him, at 82, he was still dealing with sexual temptation. Here's another reason I think this is such a big deal. If you're set apart for God sexually, you are so unique in this world that there's no telling what God might do with your life. And you can likely win every other battle. If, if, you, if you will be set apart for God sexually, you can probably win every other battle because this is a big one and it's not easy. It's also such a big deal because it's a picture, sexuality is a picture of God's plan for the whole world. You say, how, how does that work? Well, what does the Bible call the church, the bride of Christ? We, as the church, are meant to be in the closest intimate union with Him. We are His bride. So when we make a decision in any way in our life to be wholly His, completely His, to forsake all others, we then can experience the passion and joy and fruitfulness of God. And there's probably no more difficult way, but also no better way to model that than to say, Lord, I want to be sexually pure. I, I want to be set apart for you in this area of my life. I want to win these battles. You know, I think it's important to remember that, that God's the one that thought up sex. This is, this is not man's idea, uh, which, which has always kind of jumped off the pages of Scripture to me, hearing God say, I, I actually want you to have pleasure. I actually like you. God doesn't just love you. He likes you. And, and he knows that, that sex is, is beyond joy. It's joy beyond description when it's sex God's way. Sex in other ways, man, think of the mess our culture is in right now. 
Nobody seems to have any idea what even the purpose of sex or even gender is for, for that matter. And sex, apart from God's way, becomes confusing and the source of every kind of, of problem and nightmare and, and, and broken relationships. Sex, God's way, when two people choose that, it's a rare thing. But I want to tell you, when you see it, when you experience it, it's so beautiful and powerful um, that the world hardly knows what to do with it. Um, last month, we're recording this in July of 2020, in June of uh, 2020, I had the privilege of performing the wedding um, for my niece, my brother's daughter. And Haley is a godly young woman. And she married her high school sweetheart, Alex. And these two young adults just glow with Jesus. And I was talking to them. I said, what do you want to happen in your wedding? What do you want people to experience? And they said, we, we want Jesus to just shine and be honored. And we want the people there uh, to know that this is the culmination of the dream of our life. I said, well, tell me more about that. And Haley said, well, I have had a dream that, um, that when I got married in my wedding, we would be able to share with everyone that this is actually the only man I've ever kissed. And Alex said, well, I, I've had a dream as well. I, I, I wanted in the wedding for everyone to know that I never said the words, I love you, to anyone but this woman. And I was able in that wedding to share that story. And I said, today, both of those promises and those dreams come to pass before your eyes. Um, my brother came up and took Haley's promise ring and presented it to Alex. Now, I'm kind of surveying the crowd. There were jaws dropped after this amazingly beautiful ceremony, people were talking to my brother and talking to each other. And one person said something like, I've never experienced anything like that in my life. Another said, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. One person said, that's the, that's the holiest I have ever felt in a church service. It was a wedding, for goodness sakes. What was going on? There's just not very many opportunities anymore for people to see before their eyes two people that say, we want to do this God's way, even though all of our lives we've had many chances not to, and, and most people around us have chosen another way. We want to do this God's way, and we have. And there was something stunningly beautiful about it. So choosing sex our own way is actually a terrible loss for us, for others, for the kingdom. The, the world needs to see sexual purity in God's people. It's even a loss for God himself because he desires joy that comes from his way of living, especially in the area of sexuality. Now, let me stop and encourage us in our failures because some of you, you're a part of this Bible study on your own or you're in a group and you're just thinking, well, I might as well turn this off. <laughs> I'm, I'm the last thing other than sexually pure. Um, you know what I always say to people, my wife and I, when we talk to people who have failed sexually, sexually, we say, hey, look, everyone has a chance to do one of two things, to continue a great legacy or start a new one to continue a great legacy or start a new one. Holds true with, with marriage, maybe your family, you, you have an, all kind of brokenness in your, in your family when you get to start a new legacy. Um, and when it comes to sexuality, if you've, if you've failed in different ways sexually, what are you gonna do now? You can, you can start a new legacy for the rest of your life. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 11, has a long list of sin, sexual sin. And then Paul says, and such were some of you but you were washed, you were sanctified. In other words, you were set apart for God and you chose a different direction and started to leave a new legacy. Every one of you can do that, no matter what you've done in the past. But how do we hear the words of the Lord um, to the woman caught in adultery, for instance, and, and, and say, these are my words now. I receive these words. When the Lord says to her, remember, go and sin no more. How do we do that? Let me, let me give you some things from this passage that I think will help you. Number one, clearly identify your own passions. Clearly identify your own passions. Verse four says that each one of you know how to control his own body. Your passion and your temptation is not sin. Passion and temptation are not sin. The word passion simply means your, your own consuming desires. Uh, it, it can be good or bad. In, in our sexuality, our temptations likely have uniqueness. There'll be similarities. You may be tempted in some ways like me, 
but I bet you're not tempted exactly like me. One of the things my wife and I have chosen to do that helps me, um, she even knows um, the, uh, the physical features of a woman that would be attractive to me. So if we're watching a TV show together, my wife may say something like, how are your thoughts right now? Do you, do you need to be looking at something else at the moment? And that takes a long time to build a marriage like that, where she's not threatened by that, but knows she's helping me in my own unique temptations. Yours are probably different from mine in some way or the other. Uh, but the, the word passion itself can be a good word or a bad word. So identify on the, the negative side, the sexual passion that could consume you. What is, what is most tempting in your life? There's where the battle is. But also, define in your own life what a consuming passion for God should look like. And then evaluate both of those honestly and regularly. Evaluate them yourself and with others. Am I, am I moving more toward a consuming passion for God? Or am I in danger of moving more toward the consuming uh, sexual passions that could destroy my life? Here's number two. Pursue honor that is worth more to you than pleasure. Pursue honor that is worth more to you than pleasure. He, he says we're to control our own body, in verse 4, in holiness and honor. Holiness and honor. The word honor can also mean treasure. Let me ask you, what treasure do you have in your life or look forward to that sexual sin could rob from you? Um, any of you that have heard my wife and I teach know that we almost lost our marriage, not because of sexual sin, um, but I would, I would not have been surprised if that had come my way had God not healed our marriage because we were miserable and fighting all the time. But for me, there was always something in front of me, a treasure, some of it that I had and some of it that I wanted that meant more to me than the pleasure I would have had from extramarital sex. For instance, my ministry, I, I would have lost it had I had an affair. My witness, the treasure of my family, my, my, my mother and my father explaining to them why I betrayed my wife when they had kept their commitment to each other for all, all these years. There are some treasures that are worth more than pleasure and you can find the one for you uh, I always dreamed of having children and grandchildren that would respect me. Sexual immorality could have destroyed that. You know, the word sexual immorality here um, is actually a, a, a Greek word that we draw our English word pornography from, uh, pornea. We draw pornography right from that. Now, let me surprise you. I may shock you right now. I want to look at pornography. I want to. And some of you are, man, I'm going to stop listening to this guy. He wants to look at pornography. I didn't say that I did look at pornography but I want to. I have difficulty trusting people who tell me they don't want to sin. Temptation is not sin, but there are treasures that I want more than I want the pleasure that I would receive from looking at sexually uh, immoral material. I want those treasures more, uh, and I want my grandchildren in my lap respecting me for the rest of their lives. And, and so that, that honor that I pursue helps me not to trade it in for pleasure that means less to me than that honor. You have to find that honor in your life. And, and then never battle sexual sin alone. You're not meant to do it. When you live your sexuality in isolation, you're headed for disaster. In the Bible, there's no such thing as sanctification in isolation. It doesn't exist in the scripture. He says, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. He's saying, consider, consider who may be hurt by your sexual sin. If, if I were to commit sexual immorality with a woman, that's somebody's daughter. I'm harming somebody's family by doing that. Um, if you're ever on I-40 in Tennessee, if you're ever going east out of Knoxville, um, you will notice a billboard, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. Um, every time we pass it, my wife said, I know, you don't have to say anything. The billboard has a beautiful young woman on it, and it's a billboard for a, um, for a strip club. And the same young woman is on billboard after billboard all the way to the border of North Carolina. And one day, my wife and I were driving, and I looked at this, this woman, and I thought, that's somebody's daughter. I, she's up there for everybody to see. And, I, and I, tear, I came to tears. 
And every time I drive by now, I, I want to pray for her. I want to pray for, for her. That's the way you need to think about those that may sexually tempt you. They're somebody's daughter. They're not meant to be displayed to the world or to you. They matter to God. You also need people in your life who are close enough to you that you would wrong them by lying to them. And you'd break their heart if you sexually sinned. Uh, I, I have a dear friend and coach, Gary Witherall. Some of you know of Gary. His wife was martyred by Al-Qaeda years ago. And I, I did his wedding to his second wife. They're missionaries now to the same, same folks basically that killed Gary's first wife. Um, I was with Gary in the Muslim world when um, one of my other accountability partners fell into sexual sin and I got an email about it. I, I was so crushed. I had prayed with this brother to stay pure for years. I felt abandoned. I, I felt betrayed. I was angry. I was sad. And I'll never forget, Gary and I sat together and he said, John, look at me right now. He said, um, if you go to a strip club tomorrow night, I'm the one you can tell. He said, if the, he said, you never need to have an excuse that there's nobody you could talk to. He said, if for some crazy reason you commit sexual sin tomorrow, I'm the one you can tell. He said, do you understand me? You, you, you have someone in your life that cares. I'll never forget it. And you need that too. If you don't have it, seek it out. Now, as he moves toward the end of this passage, he gets into serious words. He said, the Lord is an avenger in these things. We told you beforehand. We've solemnly warned you. Warned you. God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. He says, if you disregard this, you disregard God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. These are serious words. Let them penetrate deep. But they're also victorious words. He says that he gives the Holy Spirit to you. God's Spirit lives in you. You can do everything I've taught you today and still mess up. But if you ask the Spirit of God to help you right in the moment of your biggest temptation, you'll win that battle. Watch. You find yourself in the middle of temptation and you say to God, help me right now, God, or I'm going to fail. He will never fail you. He'll never fail you. I'll finish with this. I was walking through uh, an airport years ago. I've actually written about this. Uh, we, we talked, my wife and I talked about it for a long time. Should I tell the story? Should I write about it? Um, because it, it was a near disaster story in my life. So walking through the airport, I was on one of those moving sidewalks and, um, um, and there was a woman behind me on the moving sidewalk. And it was a woman from our church. My wife and I had actually led her and her husband to the Lord. And I said, well, hi, how are you doing? And as soon as I said it, I realized it wasn't her. She was a twin, looked exactly like the woman in our, in our church, who happened to be a, a beautiful woman. She'd actually been a, a, a model in New York City before she came to Christ. And this woman looked up at me and she said, I'm fine, how are you? I'm so-and-so, and she shook my hand. And now I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. I'm, oh, well, I'm, I'm John and you know, I, I'm trying to, trying to figure out how do I get out of that? And then she starts talking and she just starts talking. And she's standing there behind me and she's talking. And in one moment while she's talking, she reached over and she touched my arm. Now, that's a little odd from a stranger. And I thought, huh. And then as we got off the moving sidewalk for maybe the second time, you know, it went on for a long way. We got off maybe the second time and she goes, oh, no. And the wheel on her suitcase broke. I think a demon was sawing it off. And I, I said, may I help you with that? And so now I'm carrying this woman's suitcase. And we're going up the escalator, and I, I said, what, what is your gate? And she told me it was my gate. And I said, oh, I, that's my gate too. She goes, you're going to New York? I, I said, well, I, I am actually going to New York um, for uh, some meetings. She said, well, what kind of meetings? And I said, well, my, my, uh, my business. And I realized my hand was in my pocket. I said, my business, not my ministry. And it dawned on me that uh, I was enjoying this woman flirting with me, and I was... I was flirting back a little bit. We walked all the way to the gate. By the time I got to the gate, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm in a dangerous place here. This woman's going to the same city where I am. Uh, this seems to be, I feel like the, the enemy's in this. And I, I, I stopped and I, I said, you know, um, it's been really great to meet you. I think I'm gonna sit down and have something to eat for a moment. Here's your suitcase. And, and uh, I just turned around and I went to this little cafe and I sat down and I said, that was crazy. That was crazy. I opened my eyes and she's coming right to me. And she sat right directly across from me and something happened that had never happened to me in my life. She said, listen, you're a very kind person. I don't want to be alone tonight. 
She said, no strings attached if you're interested. And I wish I could tell you that I was horrified, but I wasn't horrified at all. I began to think things like this. I've been sexually pure all my life. I was a virgin when I got married. I've been faithful to my wife. Man, there were times when she was tough to live with her. I, you know, why, why would it be the worst thing in the world for me to be with this beautiful woman one time? Why? And just in a little whisper, I said, God, help me. God, help me. My phone was in my hand. And um, my wife and I had what we called our emergency plan, that if I was ever in a compromising situation, I'd push speed dial, and I would tell her that I'm in trouble. And I did that. This woman said, who are you calling? And I just said, she and my wife answered, thankfully, in the first ring. I said, honey, I, I, I'm, I'm in trouble. There's a woman sitting with me that has propositioned me. The woman at this point is getting up to leave, but my wife said, put her on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have to do that, thank the Lord. But I had some explaining to do to my wife. I've never forgotten it. It terrifies me to this day because here's what I think about. I think about all that I would have lost had I lost that battle. But I also think about that woman because I lost the chance to share the gospel with her. I could have done that. I want to live this day and every day and not lose my honor or my gospel opportunity. That is your challenge and that is your opportunity as well. And that's why sex is such a big deal.